Dialogic Disciple is an invitation to explore discipleship in dialogue with the world as as disciples disciples of of the the word. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dialogic Disciple Podcast. Uh, My name is James Johnson and I'm here with my co-host... My name is Elizabeth Shaby. Elizabeth Shaby. We are here today uh, for the first time in a little while. Kind of Sorry took about the that, summer, guys. Kind of took the summer off, uh, but we're back, uh, back in the saddle, as they say, back in the habit, if you are talking about Sister Act 2. But if we're talking about... Not as great as Sister Act 1. <laughs> Such a good pull. <laughs> if we're talking about the movie Inside Out, then you've got to have, I think, a licensed therapist with you. Today we are going to be talking about Inside Out, and we have a licensed therapist with us. Look at that. Robert Vore. Hello. My name is Robert Vore. <laughs> what, are, what are all your letters, Robert? Give us the list. Um, I'm trying to think at the moment. What do I need to renew? Um, LP, <laughs> definitely in the state of Georgia, I'm a licensed professional counselor, uh, so LPC is the, the legal one at the moment, yeah. The this other one. ones have expired, so maybe... Well, there's a couple other ones that you pay for different certifications, but nobody knows what they mean. It's fine. Okay. It's all for, like, uh-huh. us. I don't know. I was giving you a chance to just, <laughs> no, like, you I know, know. Just we give you a swoop in here. And... Yeah. yeah. Fine. Well, Robert, thank you for being with us today. Yeah. Uh, you are our first host now that we're back in the game. Uh, our first co-host. Guest? guest? Yeah. I whatever. think he's a guest. You could be a co-host I, yeah, if I can you host want. if you want. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be great. Hey, welcome back to the show. <laughs> My name is Robert Vore. <laughs> You got the perfect like NPR voice. You I really like it. do. It's, it's really uh, it's really great. Um, well, today we're going to talk about uh, the movie Inside Out. As um, as a lot of people will know, we are having intergenerational Sunday school here in August at Northside Church, uh, and our our series title is Jesus Knows You Inside Out, mm. and we'll be walking through some of the maybe faith, faith lessons that we can kind of get from the movie Inside Out, the original Inside Out. I know the sequel came out this summer. Maybe talk a little bit about that uh, at some point, but uh, today we're going to focus mostly on the movie Inside Out. So let's let's start with a question: Have you seen the movie Inside Out? <laughs> Imagine if I said no and I had agreed to come in. So here. awkward. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you next uh, week. We'll see you next Could you explain it to me? Um, yes, I have. I have definitely yeah. uh, a handful of times. Uh, Especially since having kids, bits and pieces, you know, as they watch stuff, and then uh, saw the second one. Yeah, kind of first week it was out. Is I it think. Pretty good. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, it introduces a couple new kind of more complicated emotions into the mix, which yeah. uh, are are really good. But uh, we excellent. Can, you know, not to spoil it. Yeah, don't don't spoil yeah, it. No. I haven't seen it, but I'm looking forward to it. I really love this movie. So, is it? Can I get excited for the sequel? Because sometimes, yeah, yeah. Okay, I good. think so. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Sequels are sketchy. You we're never just, know. We fair. just bought tickets for Deadpool and Wolverine, so we'll be in a we'll be in a place that we'll, we'll need some emotional healing. <laughs> That's well, the next intergenerational Sunday school series. Well, yeah, yes, Deadpool, yeah. And Deadpool and Wolverine. And Deadpool. Yes. I think that I think there's a lot to uh, <laughs> a lot to pull from that. Um, so I'm trying to remember. This movie came out in 2015. This was a little bit mm-hmm. ago. I remember when it came out. I remember, you know, Pixar is fantastic. They do a great job with their their movies, and, and it's always always a good. Um, fertile ground for for faith and film kind of discussions, mm. um, and Pixar man, they just they they grab your emotions. It seems like they know yeah. what they're doing over there. Yeah, I don't know what's going on <laughs> with all of that, but whatever it is they got going on, they know what it is that they're doing, right? So, yeah. Yeah. um, uh, what, do you remember seeing this movie for the first time? Do you remember like what your emotions were, what what you felt about it, what you thought about it? Oh, I I cried for sure. I love this movie. And it was, it, I think probably my main response to that movie was finally. Hmm. They just like, someone made a movie about this. Like they're just so innovative, so creative, but like stuff that in my opinion does not get talked about enough. And so to take a concept like feelings and be able to put it in, in a film that speaks to kids, but also speaks to adults. And I mean, any, anytime we can um, put all that, you know, things that we typically keep in our brain and keep to ourselves anytime we can put that out there for conversation i think is fruitful yeah yeah Yeah. what about you robert do you remember like the first time you saw this movie i don't i don't remember i i probably saw it in theaters i guess i would have been out of college i don't but i know having that part of that probably is having watched it a couple times yeah sure yeah Yeah, on disney plus and whatnot 
Um, but I know, I mean, I, I reference it a lot and I know a, a handful of therapists that definitely do, especially those that work with kids. But I think even I don't, I don't see children a lot. And even with adults, it, it becomes this really good digestible way to talk about a lot of things with emotions and memories and how those tie together and, you know, all the emotions being adaptive and serving different roles as opposed to these ones are good, these ones are bad. Right. Right? And the mm-hmm. second one definitely dives into that, introducing anxiety as a kind of a core um, antagonist of the movie, right? Uh, and so I think that it was really a, a powerful part, again, of the second one, but even in the first one, right, like the idea that joy is consistently, I think, taking the, the mindset that or the attitude that a lot of us have perhaps of like, don't be sad, like be happy about mm-hmm. everything. Right? Right. Like that's the place we want to live. And learning by the end of it that spoilers for a 2015 movie, yeah. right? Uh, which I guess if you start listening to this and you hadn't <laughs> yeah. seen it, you're, that that's you're, kind of your own yeah, fault. Yeah, uh, but learning by the end of it that actually sadness is doing a thing, right? Yeah. Like all these other ones are also serving purposes, yeah. and so it's like all of them together that that matters and makes a whole person. Right, right. Yeah. right. It's a uh, so is this a movie that you have? <clears throat> ever used in in a, a counseling or therapy kind of situation before i mean is it yeah i don't i don't you know pull up disney plus or whatever but i definitely <laughs> reference it a lot in terms especially in terms of um memories and how so our memories are encoded with emotional information right mm. right so when you remember something when you remember it you bring it back into your body right yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the idea that like the emotional content comes back with it yeah makes a lot of sense right and and that makes sense but i don't think we we think about that often so for when people who who maybe say when i think about this thing i get really angry or i feel really sad and i don't know why because it was so long ago right? right i think it's it's helpful to say like yeah you're you're bringing that back in right yeah. like that that matters and then it also matters what we do with it right, right. When, we, when we talk about therapy and like processing through our past or whatever right like yeah. that's what we're trying to do is kind of re-engage those memories in a safe kind of supportive environment to, to change a little bit of maybe the, the emotional encoding if that's what needs to happen. Right. right. It's almost like, um, it's almost like emotions are like the soundtrack to the, to, to the memories that we have. Mm. Right. It's the music that's playing. And oh, so it kind of like does the thing in the background. Um, I, that was one of the things that blew me away about this movie. That I think that really spoke to me and something that I guess maybe I hadn't thought about a lot. So, um, but you know, it, the idea that memory plays such a, pivotal role in the development of this little girl in the movie obviously yeah um, but that it's connected to the present day emotions as well right mm-hmm. and so um what are the different emotions from the first movie do we remember i know sadness joy fear fear anger, anger and disgust and disgust <laughs> disgust yeah <laughs> Um, and she actually researched her. This. Yeah, she did yeah. apparently, or she just I just, just love this knows, movie. She just knows it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole so the the movie starts off with the kind of the premise that we just all want to be joyful all the time. You just want to be happy, mm. happy, happy, right? And that's kind of the culture we live in, the world that we live in. If you're not happy, something's wrong with you. Mm. Uh, and so all your memories need to be happy too, for exactly the reasons that you just said, right? Everything needs to be happy, happy, happy. And what we learn in the movie is that, like you just said, like. Uh, the other emotions have a pivotal role to play in the development of a complete and holistic and healthy human being. Um, and I, I think by the end of the movie, you get you get these little balls, right? The little what are they, the marbles the little, or yeah, whatever the memories, the core memories and yeah. memories. Mm-hmm. Um, and and by the end of the movie, they're all like shaded different colors based on what what emotion is is playing in the background there. Uh, and by the end of the movie, they're all like different colors or whatever. So the, so little the little girl, what's her name? Riley. Riley, yeah, yeah. Riley. Uh, she she is more of a complete human being, right? She's she's learned to process the fact that she's moved to a new town, like that. And we forget sometimes the the thing that's happening outside of her head is mm-hmm. it's pretty traumatic, right? This is something that happens to a lot of kids. It happened to me many Especially times. Especially at that together. age, yeah. Just moving yeah. around and moving to the other side, leaving your friends behind, and moving to the other side of the country or whatever. And, yeah. Um, being in that new world. Um. So uh, I guess what I what I wanted to talk about today is is what kind of things can we kind of harvest from this movie mm-hmm. that, that may help us in our, in our faith journey or in our faith walk? Um, what, what's, what are some of the things that thinking about emotion in this way and thinking about memory in this way, uh, can help us further our faith or, or understand who we are as disciples a little bit better? Well, I think you just hit one big thing, um, which is that this tension idea, which we're actually talking about, 
maybe using as a theme for our next set of devotionals, um, because there's so much in our faith that requires us to hold tension um, between two opposing ideas. And, you know, we've talked about this before. We're humans. We like just black, just white. Gray is a lot harder. Um, But trying to hold that space between two opposing ideas. And that's what we see in this movie. Like you said, you know, Joy is trying to make all the memories happy. It's all happy. And then, you know, suddenly sadness. You you get the blue memory and it's like this tragedy. Oh, my gosh. We have a blue. Ah, terrible. You know, but then by the end of the movie, you get the orbs that are blue and yellow. And it's this idea that we can have we can have them both and they can coexist joy and sadness but not just that they can coexist but they can actually help each other yeah. so the joyful memory becomes like that 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 original core memory that was just pure joy actually occurred because of a sad moment that happened before right. and then i think at the end it's not that there was a sad memory and then there was a happy memory it's that this happy memory was created because of this sad thing that came before it yeah. and learning to hold those things together and understand Understanding them as one entire experience instead of two separate experiences. Yeah. So that tension thing, that's that's a big that's yeah. a big one for me. Yeah. I, I think that's good. I mean, when, when I think about in in the context of faith, I mean, there's so much in obviously like Western Christianity and like our our kind of uh, Christian culture, right? About being joyful and being thankful and and all of that, and that faith brings joy and all that right yeah. like all kind of like the the victorious like worship you know and i think that that tension right of like the not uh, what we would call spiritual bypassing right we are like hey mm. this terrible thing happened and i'm really sad and someone's like well but make sure that you're also thankful because this other and you're like yeah. oh, okay, i can do both of these yeah yeah, yeah. Right? like i don't i think holding both of those things in tension and knowing that that it's not this kind of like dichotomy right it doesn't have to be one or the other but that like you said that that they work together right and they're serving purposes there they're serving right so the the one i think in in the the ending of this movie that you were talking about right it's she's really sad Mm -hmm. about something and the memory is that she's sad because of hockey something or Mm -hmm. and because of that 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 sadness like compels connection where then her parents are there with her which is the joyful memory right right it's like the sadness was a sense of loss or a sense of something like that. And then it, it invites connection in a moment where we need that. Right. And so if we say, well, just don't do that. Just only focus, you know, you go, well, okay, then I'm just squishing that down and pretending. And then I'm not seeking out community when I need it. I'm not, right. you know, or whatever, or when I'm angry, I'm not doing, you know, like all those types of things. If we say you only have to pretend everything's all good all the time, that's not going to lead probably to like genuine experience with, the world or with like a faith component right yeah and i think the the connection piece that you just mentioned um is really important the movie does a great job of highlighting the fact that it's in moments of suffering or moments of sadness that we really where our empathy really starts to come out Hmm. um you know it's hard for that's not hard for us i guess but it's just um, (coughs) we're less likely to empathize with somebody who's in a joyful happy mood it's not because it doesn't feel like they really need empathy, right? There's not a, like, like empathetic kind of situation. There. But we see someone mm-hmm. who's suffering or somebody who's sad. There's something that, that, that draws out of us a connection, a desire for connection uh, and community. And that's really like that's the best, like the deepest and, and most profound and um, meaningful communities are built off of that kind of, of connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the other great moment that speaks to that in the movie, um, the imaginary friend, Bing Bong, Bing Bong right? Oh my gosh, he's, the saddest part. Of the he's movie. so sad. Well, he he's sitting there and How he's crying. How many Bing Bongs have we lost? Let's have a I moment know. of silence for, for all the, the Bing, Bing Bongs, bongs mm. that we've lost in our life. Bing Bong. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The saddest part of the movie <laughs> being f- focused around the phrase "bing bong" is like really thrown. There's that That's tension, great. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. But they're in. They're sitting there in in the caverns of memory, and Bing Bong starts crying. He's crying candy, and Joy is just trying to cheer him up. Which, come uh, on, Bing Bong, let's move, on. let's go. Yeah, you know. Exactly. And I think that's the other side of the coin that sometimes we it's hard to sit with people that are sad. We don't yeah. want them to be sad. We love them so much. We don't want you to be sad, and so we're going to try and cheer you up, and we want to move past it. Let me help you get through this yeah and so but and that's not helping bing bong he just keeps crying and then sadness comes up and she just sits down next to him and she says you know like this is hard 
Like, I see that you're sad. Yeah. Like, I miss whatever it is that he's mourning, you know? Like, yeah. I, I get yeah. it. And then, then that's when it turns and he, he's heard yeah. and he feels validated and someone else understands what he's feeling. And then they, I think they hug and, yeah. and then he can move on and then yeah. he can get up and they he can, can keep going. And it's yeah. just, yeah, yeah, that's the connection moment. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a quote that, and it, I won't give all the backstory necessarily, but it's basically about like that neurologically we know what helps somebody feel safe, mm-hmm. right? Like a, a relational sense of safety from like a relational standpoint. And it's when we're able to be present with somebody uh, in a, with a non judgmental stance with no agenda, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. so I think often about when we're trying to cheer somebody up, part of that is because we care and we don't like that. And that's totally fine. That's like yeah. obviously really, val- really valid. I do think we need some uh, self-reflection probably in terms of like, if, if I came to you and I was crying, does that make you really uncomfortable? Oh. And that's part of it. Like I need to cheer you up so that then we can both move about our day <laughs> yeah. or yep. like, because I, this is really weird for me. Right. Yeah. Or is it because I feel the need to do something in which case, and again, like all of, all of those things are pretty normal and I, I'm, none of that is judgmental. I just think it, it invites reflection sitting with somebody in that kind of like non-judgmental stance right like just being present is doing something because we're helping somebody feel safe right so like even if you're like well i'm not gonna do nothing i would say you're not doing nothing right even though that's like a really hard thing like we're very action driven you know Yeah. yeah and so i think a lot of even in 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 the therapy room or i'm sure in like pastoral counseling right yeah a lot of that space is just being there and like listening and offering obviously like some reflection and asking you know questions when need be mm-hmm. but a lot of times it's like yeah that sounds really hard yeah that, yeah yeah that's you know that's, yeah i mean that's that's what i've so many times i need that in my life you know and it's like you know the person that you're sitting with they, they want to do something it's like you are doing so much just by sitting here and letting me cry <laughs> yeah that's all that's all yeah. i need i just need to hold my hand and i just need to cry and the yeah. fact that you can handle that is that's all I need. That's yeah. amazing. What a gift. That's a lot. It reminds me of uh, the book of Job, the story of Job, right? Where Job, <laughs> oh, Job, yes. Job goes like the worst Tuesday ever. And uh, his friends show up, his three buddies show up. And for the first seven days, everything's cool. They just sit with them. That's mm-hmm. all they do is they sit mm-hmm. with them. And then they, they open their mouths and things go downhill from there. But <laughs> but that's, that's exactly what they're doing is providing that that space for him. Um, yeah. And I, one of the stories that we're going to talk about during the during the um, Sunday school this August is is trying to wrestle with sadness in Jesus and and what mm. how did Jesus deal with that? You know, we we think of oftentimes, particularly Western Christianity, we think of Jesus as a hero, superhero, and he's always happy and he's always you know other than that little incident on the cross, everything else is pretty good. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and um, we're, one of the stories we're going to talk about is when Jesus shows up to the, to uh, he you know he finds out that one of his best friends Lazarus is sick and he shows up to to heal him maybe or whatever and finds out he's been dead for four days and even though Jesus knows exactly what he's about to do he knows mm-hmm. he's about to call Lazarus from the grave he takes the time to sit with and weep with the people there who have gathered to to mourn. Uh, the death of this guy and he knows he's about to bring him back from the dead like he knows what he's about to do but he takes the time just to sit and weep and that's when you get the shortest verse in the bible right jesus yeah. wept uh and it's really powerful and it's something that we <laughs> we don't i don't i don't we don't spend a lot of time reflecting on when people tell that story they want to jump straight to the end where he calls lazarus from the grave right mm-hmm. yeah um and and Jesus does exactly what you're talking about, Robert. He sits, he just sits with the people and, and weeps with them. He's moved mm-hmm. by their, their brokenness. And, and there's yeah. something, there's something about that. He doesn't give a lesson. He doesn't teach anything. He just sits there yeah, and weeps. Well, and, and I would say that he, he's also experiencing his own sadness and like willing to do that. Not <laughs> there's, there's the sitting with the people and yeah. empathize, but it's also like, I'm willing to experience my own sadness over this person that I love Yeah, and I'm willing to show it too, which yeah. is another huge thing. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's perhaps the space that we're in a lot of times, right? In this, as, as Jesus people <clears throat> in this, like knowing, believing in the future and believing in things that s- somehow mysteriously, like, are but are also not yet yeah and in that tension of like can we still does this still matter here right if somebody 
has lost somebody or is experiencing, you know, if you, oh, well, it'll all work out, even if I could guarantee that, which obviously I can't, but if you, even if I could guarantee that, this moment still also matters. Yeah. Like how you're experiencing yeah. this moment also still matters. And so can I be with you in this moment knowing that things will also change, right? right. Like can I, can I do that and not right. just go, oh, but you know, everything will be fine. And mm-hmm. You'll do this and you'll see them again in heaven and you'll get a new job or, or you know, whatever it is. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, those things can be helpful, like, sure, sure. yeah. but also, this part yeah. is, is hard, this part sucks, you know what if, I mean? Like if that, only like, because, if only because, in, like, in the movie, um, <laughs> this, whatever this present moment is, whatever it is we're going through that's the suffering or the sadness or whatever, it will become a memory that mm. then shapes who we are as a mm. person, right? So if Ooh, only yeah. because this present moment, whatever it is, is going to build our character or tear down our character, depending upon how mm. we respond to it, if only because of that, then it's really important, right? The the present is really the only thing you have. Uh, and all of that gets filed away, you know, in a little marble or whatever, or however it works, <laughs> you know? Uh, but it, it does become um, very much a part uh, of the core of who we are is is how we deal with how we deal with sadness and suffering and and you know the bible is very clear on that too i think it's romans chapter five where paul talks about our suffering leads to endurance which builds character and and Mm. finally produces hope so that hope hope the kind of hope you're talking about the resurrection's coming it's all going to work out in the end someday um but that hope is built on and built through pain and Mm -hmm. suffering and those things Mm. are really you can't just kind of step around them you have to go through them I have a professor that talks about what it means to be a Saturday people. Um, so that, that day in between, right? Jesus dying, the cross, the grief, the darkness, and knowing that Easter Sunday is coming, the resurrection is there, it's ahead of us. But what does it mean to sit in that Saturday experience and yeah. acknowledge Friday, yeah. but know that Sunday's coming? Yeah. I like that. I like that language. Yeah. But when, yeah, because when you only focus on resurrection, I think to get back to what you were talking about with the connection piece, like when you only celebrate and focus on resurrection and you don't take the time to sit with the darkness and, and learn what it means to empathize with those who are suffering and listen to those who are suffering, your faith, if only because it's not as connected, becomes way more shallow. It's not mm. as fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. And then when something terrible does happen, you maybe don't have the resources, the emotional resources or communal resources to really get through that in a way that's going to be healthy. Yeah. So, Robert, you, uh, you've you seen the second movie. Yeah. Uh, have you seen it more than once? No, I saw, Not yet. Uh, okay. yeah, I saw it once, yeah. Uh, is there a way you can talk to us a little bit about, I know that they, so Ry, it's still Riley, mm-hmm. right? She's yep. now a teenager. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a little girl who's nine years old who will be a teenager Ooh. very soon, already kind of acts like one. Um, terrifies me a little bit. <laughs> um, but uh, is there any way you can talk about uh, the movie uh, and and some of the new stuff that they introduce? You mentioned anxiety mm-hmm. without spoiling the film or anything like that. Like, I'm interested to know yeah. how what what's the next step they take because I haven't seen the movie yet. Yeah, uh, they definitely uh, introduce a couple kind of uh, more complicated, kind of nuanced uh, emotions and. Uh, particularly in in relation to adolescence, obviously, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's there's a handful of other new ones that come up. A- anxiety being the kind of primary driver of a lot of what's happening, right? Um, and what I think is interesting is Joy learns a s- kind of a similar lesson uh, as the first one, but in in relation to anxiety. But I think you you get to see a lot of the anxiety playing out and like what anxiety is trying to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, which joy obviously views as like something that perhaps needs to be solved or needs yeah, to right, you know right. be counteracted, but I think it does a really good job. And I bring this up because anxiety is what I what I work with probably the most of presenting anxiety as like this adaptive thing that that matters and that makes sense. And I think when we approach it like that, it's really really helpful for people to know like instead of something is wrong, right? Like, okay, I can understand what's happening. My my body, my nervous system, my brain are all doing a thing that makes sense and that I can work with in terms of helping myself to, to feel safe. So or, kind of it, it's putting anxiety in a positive light. Like this has a role to play yeah, in, in the yeah. way that we develop as human beings, in yeah. the way we interact with the world. That's fascinating. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't know anybody who talks about anxiety as a positive thing. Well, and yeah. not necessarily positive, but you're saying like if you can understand its purpose, yeah. then it, you can work with it. 
Yeah, uh, uh, adaptive is yeah. typically yeah. how I okay. talk about it, right? And okay. so if we think about anxiety as fear in the future tense, right? As like okay. a broad brush thing, yeah. right? So a present tense fear response, right? Fight, flight, freeze, like all those things, right? We could map it out on a little stick figure. <laughs> those things happening present tense within you, right? In relation to a potential future threat, right? So you get an email from your boss that says, Monday morning, come see me. And you feel anxious, right? Right, yeah. That's a present tense fear response, all of which would be really helpful if a bear had knocked down the door and was chasing you, right? Right, right uh, yeah. Your heart rate goes up and you get muscle tension and uh, you're like, rest and digest system kind of turns off and dumps all of its resources into the fight or flight stuff, right? It's all survival stuff, right? Yeah. Your pupils probably dilate, yeah, right? Yeah, Maybe yeah. you sweat. All these things happen that are geared to, to keep you alive. They're geared for survival, but they're not helpful in this moment, right? Right. And so we have to be able to go, okay, thanks, body. I, like, I understand <laughs> what you're trying to do. It's not that something's wrong. Right. How do I help you present tense to experience safety or, okay. or things like that right and so if you you know deep breathing or if you go eat a little snack or if you get a sip of cool water like all those things you wouldn't be doing if you were fighting for your life fighting for your life and so those sensory information gets those are cues of, okay. of safety right so, so we're trying to like shift yeah. back to the present tense okay so does that how's that related to like panic attacks and things like that yeah i mean so for panic attacks and anxiety attacks which are pretty closely related right a lot of the, the the most standard thing people are going to say, right, is do like a grounding technique, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so like the, the most common one would be kind of this five, four, three, two, one with your senses, which is like, hey, can you name me five things that you can see right now? Can you name me four things that you can hear right now? Three things that you can feel, two things you can smell or whatever, right? And what that's doing is bringing you sensorily like from an embodied perspective back into the present moment like wherein present, you are safe where you are safe yeah right? mm -hmm. um and so doing those types of things like experientially as opposed to cognitively can i try and convince you yeah that you are safe right a lot of times when someone's scared i sometimes i, I talk to my clients about like if there was a little kid right so i have two little i have two small kids you have a kid who's a little bit bigger than mine if a little kid was super scared, right? Came out and said, oh my gosh, there's monsters in my... And they were freaking out, right? Yeah. You wouldn't stone face go, obviously monsters do not exist. That's such a silly... <laughs> let me just cognitively... Right? You, yeah, would kind of, you would kind of bend down and you, <laughs> right, would, yeah. you would talk kind of softly and slowly yeah. and you would, you know, get on their level and maybe give yeah. them a little hug, rub their back, right? You would yeah. say, Hey, it's so, a you know. What well, can I walk you back? Do you want to drink a water? Right? Like yeah. you would do all these things them that feel we safe. do that we do inherently, right? Like yeah. we just know that that these things are going to help you feel safe right, right in this moment and maybe we also would say let's go we can go look or whatever you know hey it's okay but we're not it's not purely from like a cognitive logical you know which right. i think yeah. is how we how we approach ourselves a lot of times right mm -hmm. when we start freaking out about something we go well i shouldn't be feeling this way because blank 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 and right, like, yeah well yeah but your Arguments body doesn't matter, your body's yeah. feeling this thing so like can we work with that yeah yeah is it the same kind of strategy work in like um, moments of intense grief or moments of intense uh, sadness uh, or is it is it different? I think it would be different if only that like attending to the present moment is would still be sad. Right. Like right. and that's OK. Like, I, yeah. you know, that thing is also uh, if we go back to the first movie. Right giving you information and energy, right? So uh, standardly, I say um, our emotions are giving us information and energy to do something with like whatever's happening, right? So in a sense of like grief or sadness, right? Okay, I'm perceiving some type of loss probably, right? And then potentially the, the information or the energy is to seek out connection or comfort or something like that, right? Which like we would say makes sense from like we want to be people with the community and things, yeah. you know, like, and so like I think that's okay, you know? Um, and so not, Kind of, but not, not okay. quite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. In relation to the anxiety thing, I heard someone talk about it once, you know, the, the bear example, right? It's really mm -hmm. good, right? The yeah. bear, it's the survival thing, but that sometimes that, that fear response is in relation to the memory of a bear. Hmm. Or the anticipation of a bear, right? It's the, yep. or understanding the difference between the bear in the room, right? Oh, there's a bear, I gotta run. Or, oh, I remember that there was a bear once in a situation very much like this. And, or, oh, there could be a bear, you know? And then your body's yeah. having the same response. Yeah. That anxious response to any of those situations. But I just thought that was a helpful way to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and those are, those are paired 
a lot, right? Our as we were talking about our memories impacting yeah. how we go forwards, right? Again, because that is adaptive, that's survival based, right? If you're a caveman and you eat bushes out of this berry and a bunch of bees come out and sing you or something, right? Next time you see that bush, you're gonna be like, I don't know, maybe not, right? Yeah. Because that's how we stayed alive, right? Yeah. And similar thing now where you go, oh, I don't know, when someone sends me a text message and there it says okay and there's a period on it, sometimes that um, I don't know. I knew somebody that like when they did that, it communicated something that they were mad at me, and so now now I'm worried about that. Yeah. Right? Like mm-hmm. it's it's all connected. Yeah, yeah. that's fascinating. Yes. Yeah, that's really fascinating. <laughs> uh, so it sounds to me like, uh, Robert, one of the things you're trying to say, uh, or one of the things that you believe in, in the conversations that we've been having today is one of the most important things for people to feel in the present moment hmm. is safe. Yeah, I th- yes, yeah, I would say so. I mean, I th- so, I mean, safety, and when I say the word safe, obviously that, that conjures up a lot of physical safety, but even mm-hmm. like relational yeah. safety, right? Yeah, yeah. I think matters... Because when we're when we're in kind of like a safe and social as opposed to like a fight or flight or like a freeze, right? Safe and social is when we can grow at all, when our creative part is unlocked, when any connection stuff, right? Safety and connection are, are kind of inextricably linked for humans. So like when you're um when you're in kind of like a fight or flight type response, right? The the this is fascinating. The tension in your ear muscles change and it's better at picking up really high frequencies and really low frequencies really? because those are indicators traditionally of danger yeah right? oh, that's wow. birds fascinating chirping, birds chirping or not yeah or like oh wow really low sounds right every human voice is in the middle right so if i don't feel safe i actually have a harder time hearing you oh, right wow yeah okay. so like uh, and there's a bunch of things like that obviously where like if i'm anxious and my thoughts are going all over i'm not in this moment with you right Right. so like connection creativity growth all those like all those things exist primarily in like a kind of relational safety or and physical safety but like in a in a safety space yeah much less so in a fight or flight or a freeze or any kind of those like stress states so would you say then um and maybe this is maybe too philosophical but would you say that um being able to stay in the present moment, being able to be in the present, being able to be present in the moment, mm. right, uh, is a, is an indicator that you do feel safe. I mean, that you, from an emotional, at least from a, a psychological point of view. Does that question make Rob, sense? Um, I'm trying to think about. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to think about um, if I could step outside of Western religion for just a second. Think about yeah. some Eastern ways in which yeah. people think about faith and and human consciousness and things like that seems like being present in the moment is really, really important in a way that it doesn't seem to be for us in the West as much. Sure. And maybe that there's a draw to that. Feeling safe or feeling feeling uh, unthreatened, I don't know. Grounded. I, grounded. Grounded, maybe the best word for that. Yeah, I think so. And I think especially in terms of, so pretty much everything right now is, is, is in our culture, again, Western, right, is geared towards like not being present, right? So yeah, I have five right. minutes, I'm going to scroll around on my phone or right. oh, I should get ahead on this yeah. stuff or whatever, yeah. you know, like it's very hard to like be present, um, which obviously has, has all sorts of impacts. But so in terms of, of being able to sit in some of that tension that we talked about right sit in uncomfortable emotions that yeah. we might we might say like the bad ones right but i, I typically say like the unpleasant ones right yeah. mm-hmm. and and the ability to do that the more that we do that right obviously means that then we feel okay with that so i was actually uh, just talking downstairs with angela about um when i do crisis trainings for campus ministries and stuff right i i did i start with a definition of a crisis because it doesn't matter what you think is a crisis, it matters what the other person, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the, the definition that I use is when somebody encounters a, a, a situation or obstacle or something that they either don't have the, the tools or resources to navigate or mm. that they perceive they don't have the tools or resources oh, that's to navigate. Excellent. Right? Yeah. It can be internal, external, whatever. So right. if your car breaks down, is that a crisis? I don't, do you have money to buy a new one? Do you have a spare car? Right. Do you have somebody that can pick you up? Do you know how to fix a car? All of those yeah. things would make it not a crisis. But if you don't have any of that, it perhaps it is a crisis, crisis, right? Yeah. And so in terms of like, if I, f- if I start to feel angry, if I have no idea what to do with that, because I've never been allowed to like sit with that mm-hmm. or know that mm-hmm. like, you can be angry for a little bit and that that is a safe thing to have. Like, that's okay. You can be angry for a little bit and you'll, you'll be okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if everyone, if I'm always going, 
how do I get out of this? How do I, how do I solve this? How do I fix yeah. this? How do I avoid yeah, yeah, this? Yeah. Right. Then every time I, I experience that, I don't know what to do. And so I, it like heightens it, right? Because right. then I don't feel safe even experience what we call secondary emotions. If I feel anxious and I think that that means something is wrong, then obviously I'm going to start being scared about that. <laughs> right. yeah. I'm going to be anxious. Right. Or, I'm scared up. to get anxious. Yeah. 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 Or like in uh-huh. parenting, right? So I think a lot of this, I, I'm, I filter some of this through like parenting, right? If my kids are doing something that is like really obnoxious, right? And I love my kids, but kids sometimes, yeah. you know, they throw mashed potatoes at the wall. Kids are right? terrible. If I start to feel angry and then part of me goes, I really don't want to be an angry dad, right? Yeah. <laughs> if I can go, okay, can I take some deep breaths? Can I do something? Right? Like, can I attend to what's happening right. in like a genuine way? Like the anger is okay. Let me make sure that my next step is not out of that. Right. Right. That's a very different experience than if I, if part of me goes, don't be an angry dad. That's so dumb. Don't be angry. You should be able to right? Then I'm mad at myself for the anger. Yeah. Right. Then I'm heightening everything. Yeah. And none of that is making me a more patient dad. Right. right? Like I'm right. still, I'm just adding to it. I'm cycling. Right. Yeah. So like, can I, can I be okay and safe with just like, taking a pause and being present to that experience within me and then attending to it in like a genuine way. Right. You know? Yeah. So related to that, um, one of the things that really, so I was, I kind of, I watched the movie and did a bunch of notes and stuff on this first movie to, to, to prepare for the Sunday school class. And one of the things that jumped out to me that really surprised me. Uh, in the beginning, you were like, what's the little girl's name? So <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, I forget details like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just uh, minor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one of the things that jumped out to me uh, in the movie, talking. This is a movie that is ostensibly about emotion, right? And it is about uh, these primary emotions that shape our memory and who we are. Um, one of the things that really jumped out to me is big ones missing. Seems like to me, mm. for a lot of us anyway, we talk about love, right? Mm. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out, well, where does love appear in this film? And I, I at the very end of the movie, when Riley has run away and she's come back and then she's loved and embraced by the family, it's a great moment. Your tears come down, you know, whatever. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking, well, there's a love right there. There's love. And now I'm thinking, uh, and I, w- I was thinking in terms of, well, all of these emotions coming together, because love is not really, we like to say it's not an emotion, it's something else. But now that in the conversation that we're having, what's coming to my head, and so I want to play with this with you guys for a minute, is that love really is that feeling of safety and being mm-hmm. able to provide that feeling of safety mm-hmm. for people, not just... Not just uh, physically, but emotionally, internally, externally, and that's is 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 that what we see Jesus doing when he encounters the woman at the well? When he when he encounters people who are are sick and need healing, because he doesn't always he it doesn't seem to me Jesus is only concerned about people's physical situations. He cares about what they feel, what they see, what they understand, uh, and so. Is there a way to try to translate what we see in Jesus or what we do in our own lives as, as love being not just an emotion, but per, when we love somebody, what we're trying to do is, is make them feel safe or at least give them a way toward safety. I always or have go, I misunderstood that? No, I, I like that. I always go back to Bell Hooks' definition. She says, love is not a feeling, it's an action. Right. And so to me... Or DC Talk, love is a verb. Or that. That works too. That's fine. <laughs> Different ways to approach the same thing. Um, <laughs> also, they capitalize their name appropriately. So, that, that all right, helps. we're not going to get into that. Be quiet. Just kidding. Um, Jokes. I feel like they don't, though. I feel like it's also <laughs> all <asking>. lowercase. <laughs> I knew I liked this guy. I knew I liked this guy. Um, right. So, I would say what what I hear and what I would push towards is that love is not a feeling. Right. Right. Y- yes, we can feel safe. But it, love is an experience, and so it's about what it means to to be the hands and feet, to have to do an action yeah. that then creates an experience for the person, right? So Jesus mm. talking to the woman, right? He's trying to make her feel safe, but it's an experience. What that is, that experience of her bringing her sadness. Her anxiety about the future, her embarrassment about her past and all the men that she's married or having a hard time with, whatever. Yeah. And it's Jesus meeting that and creating this space of safety for her. Right. Um, that's that's and we would love. call that love, right? It's it's to me, it's much hmm. more um, not 3D, but it's much more 
action and experience oriented and it's not something that is isolated in our head right it, it has to occur between between people whether it's you and you jesus say it, almost, it has to be dialogic almost. right yeah yeah, yeah. so right. that's why i would say I, it makes sense to me not to have love as a six character sitting there in a pink tutu in your head that's not how that works right right and i'm glad that they didn't do that i think it, there would have been a temptation to do that because I think we do in our culture think of love as an emotional kind of thing. Yeah. It's like a single digit thing in our head. But uh, Robert, what do you, what do you think about? What yeah. We- I, I think, uh, so I, I think we use love in a, a wide variety of ways. And so some of that That's obviously is sorting yeah. through. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think the, the action component, I also think perhaps about like a, like a capacity, right? Mm-hmm. So like, can I, sit in discomfort with you while you're crying and not need to fix anything even though that's a little uncomfortable for me so i'm in in providing that space in trying to do that for you i'm also growing in myself that capacity right yeah because the more that i can do that the more comfortable i'll be with that right yeah i can sit in silence forever in a therapy session with somebody who's upset and i don't know that it's like a natural thing for me i think that that has grown over time right yeah. so like the like the more that i've done that and then that capacity in different areas, right? When my, when my, again, just because this is what I do with the rest of my time, <laughs> when my children are really upset, it's much harder for me not to try and like jump in and fix it than it right. is in like a therapy session. It's just a different version of me. There's different parts of me like wrapped up in that. Yeah. And so like I'm working on expanding my capacity to do that in that space as well. I still love them a bunch, which is why I'm trying to do that, right? right. Trying to get better at it. So I think in some ways it's like, it, it is so 3D where it's like it's the action and it's perhaps the – there's some emotion in terms of like I, I am compelled to do that, right? We want to be more loving people who walk by somebody and say they do need something. Let me do that even if it's at the cost to myself. Yeah. And it's the capacity to do that, right? Like I think it's all of those things. Yeah, that's good. Great talk today, guys. It's a fantastic conversation. Robert, thank you so much for taking some time to sit with yeah. us. Thank yeah. you, Robert. Me we too. are we excited to you. be back on the air and hopefully pushing forward with new uh, new episodes every week. And Robert, we hope that you'll come join us again some point uh, yeah. later on this year. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you for being here. Thank and you, Dr. James Johnson. Thank you James for having Johnson. the capacity to deal with me on this uh, podcast. <laughs> and guys, thank you for it's listening. We will uh, we'll see you next week.